you know, the state of thriving is kind of this continuous flux where we get a little bit of sympathetic activation back into parasympathetic, a little bit of that sympathetic back into parasympathetic. Um, when we have high levels of sympathetic, we start moving up, you know, and, and it, when it's present for a, an extended period of time, we move into that dorsal activation where it's more of a freeze, right? So we're kind of body collapse, immobility. We're not able to really cope with the stress that we're under. It's a burnout, it's a state of burnout. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not a good place, right? Uh, it's a low endorphin place where we don't have the endorphins. We have, uh, you know, increased pain threat, you know, increased pain in our system and just, we're not able to, to function at our best. And so hopefully, you know, we're able to get and maintain in that ventral vagal state. And that's what we're looking for. So yeah, I mentioned how the vagus nerve plays a really key role in this kind of gut brain axis is communication patterns. So the gut is constantly communicating to the brain. The brain is constantly communicating to the gut. The major nerve that's leading that is the vagus nerve. It's the communication bidirectional communication pathway between the gut and between the brain. It helps activate motility, sort of moving feces through. And it's the, the you know the different neurotransmitters that are pre being produced in the gut interact with the vagus nerve, giving the brain signals as far as what's happening there in the gut. And this is why we call the gut the second brain. There's a lot of neurotransmitters in there, lots of um, uh, sensory information that's taking place, motor activity that's taking place, and it's all feedback into the brain through that vagus through the sensory system of the vagus. And then of course the vagus also has the motor end that's helping activate the gut as well. So whatever's happening in the gut is going to really dramatically impact vagal tone. Now, major causes of poor vagal tone, chronic stress and poor sleep, really big in our society. Early childhood traumatic experiences. Most people that are experiencing this, this dorsal uh, vagal activity typically have had some major traumatic experiences, maybe, you know, sexual, uh, or, or, um, physical abuse when they were young. And so that's really unfortunate, but, um, that's a major contributor, head injuries, concussions, things like that. Um, definitely will throw off vagal tone, poor breathing mechanics, poor posture, poor breathing mechanics play a big role. The way we breathe helps to activate or deactivate parasympathetic activity, vagal activity, chronic infections. You know, we talked about the gut brain. So chronic infections, most of the time in the gut will impact vagal tone as well. Blood sugar imbalances. We talked about how important vagal tone is for keeping blood sugar stable. So for eating foods that cause major blood sugar imbalances, that's going to throw off, it's going to overload the vagal activity and to try to balance it and can cause poor vagal tone. And then high toxic load, toxins, neurotoxins, mycotoxins, so heavy metals, uh, pesticides, herbicides, mold, and mycotoxins all dramatically impact uh, vagal nerve activity. Now, a couple tests we can do for vagal tone. One is called the pupillary constriction test. So when a light is shine in the eyes, the pupil should constrict for at least 10 seconds for dilating. So constricting would mean shrink and should hold for at least 10 seconds before it kind of gives out and then dilates, meaning that the pupil gets bigger, right? So it gets smaller, holds, and then it will get bigger. If it constricts, so if it gets smaller and then dilates in less than 10 seconds, or it fails to constrict, doesn't even constrict at all, could be a sign of poor vagal tone. So when somebody has height, heightened sympathetic activity, oftentimes, it will constrict, but it will give out after a few, you know, four or five, six seconds. You'll just see it pulsating and then boom, give out. When somebody is in that dorsal ventral, or I'm sorry, dorsal vagal uh, tone, right? When they're when they're uh, dorsal dominated ventral activity, so they're you know in that state of um, <clears throat> burnout. Oftentimes, it won't even constrict, or it will constrict and blow out right away and just dilate right away. Now, second thing is heart rate to breath rate comparison. So, and and for the pupillary constriction test, really, you just take like a little pen light, you're kind of shining it near the person's eyes, and it's mildly irritating, right? It's irritating kind of the eye, but should be able to hold that for about ten seconds. So, that's kind of the standard there. Heart rate to breath rate comparison. Normal heart rate is sixty to one hundred beats per minute. Normal breath rate is twelve to twenty breaths per minute. 
This is roughly a five to one ratio. If the ratio is more than five to one. So if the heart rate is up higher than the breath rate, it could be a sign of poor vagal tone. So let's say your heart rate is 80 and your breath rate is uh, 12, right? That ratio would be more than five to one. So your heart rate's just, it's, it's much higher than it should be for the amount of breaths you're taking. That's a sign of poor vagal tone. Heart rate variability. This is something you can do. Like there's certain tests. There's also um, like kind of things that you can wear, like the aura ring, things like that, that will tell you your heart rate variability. And that's the variance between heartbeats. It can be measured on various wearable devices. Blood pressure. Normal blood pressure level should be between 100 at the top. So systolic should be 100 to 140, over 70 to 90 diastolic. If this is abnormally high or low, it can be an indication of poor vagal tone. So if your blood pressure is 160 over 100, right, could be poor vagal tone. Obviously, inflammation plays a role in that. Um, now, this, you know, it should be a resting blood pressure, not like a blood pressure you're taking when you're exercising. Then it should be up higher. For a lot of people, and like for me, I know when I had irritable bowel and I was dealing with HPA axis dysfunction, my blood pressure would regularly be somewhere around like 100 or like 90 over 50. It was really, really low. And that was a sign that I was not getting the sympathetic activation. So I was actually in a dorsal vagal activity, right? Which is not where we want to be. So it wasn't a place where I could heal. And now it's because I had gut infections. Um, I was living in a home with mold and mycotoxins and it was wearing down my system. And I was back in my early twenties. Orthostatic hypotension. This is another thing we can check. This is when blood pressure doesn't rise quick enough when an individual goes from sitting to standing, which can result in feelings of dizziness and poor balance. This is pretty easy to, to see. I mean, you can test blood pressure, but really it's just going from sitting to standing. So you sit, you stand up, you sit for five minutes, let's say, then you go ahead and you stand up. You should feel fine. You should be able to stand up, experience no issue, just go right into whatever you want to do next. If you feel dizzy and it's hard to maintain your balance, that's a sign of orthostatic hypotension. You're not getting the vagal activity enough to get the blood pressure to regulate and uh, get more blood flow up into the brain. So that's an issue. So let's look at some solutions. The importance of intentional breathing. This is a great quote by Sheldon Hendler, uh, MD, PhD. From the, he wrote the book called The Oxygen Breakthrough. He says, breathing is the first place, not the last place one should investigate when any disordered energy presents itself. So it's super important. We know slow, deep breathing could trigger a relaxation response in the body that slows the heart and re reduces stress. Breathing through the nose or nasal breathing filters the air is better for oxygen uptake, actually increases uh, nasal nitric oxygen, which helps dilate the blood vessels in the brain. Very, very key for um, overall neurological activity. The exhale, which slows the heart rate, should be longer than the inhale. So we should actually be taking longer exhalations than inhalations. We should keep our shoulders as relaxed as possible. The neck and shoulder muscles shouldn't be part of the breathing process. Take a bigger breath by forcing your abdomen to expand. As the diaphragm extends, it pushes your ribs out. So just good breathing form in general can make a big difference. Being a state of gratitude, right? Really refocusing your mind on gratitude is super critical for having healthy vagal tone. People who are grateful have more resilience. They're able to adapt to stress more effectively. Little things don't get to them the way they do for people that lack uh, gratitude. For people that lack gratitude, it's almost like for many individuals, they're looking for reasons to be offended. Something happens, they get offended, and they dwell on that. And by dwelling on that, they create more stress. And so they're, they're activating more of that sympathetic nervous system activity and eventually they're going to move from ventral to dorsal vagal activity and get more depressed. And so we want to really focus on, on gratitude as much as possible and being an individual that's grateful. And a couple tips for that is to keep a daily journal of three things you're thankful for. Every day, daily journal, three things you're thankful for. Have conversations with your family or your loved ones, people that are close to you, your friends, whoever it is that's you know around you the most about things that you're thankful for each day. Tell someone in your life something you appreciate about them every day, your spouse, your friends. Tell them, uplift them, encourage them, and that will help you, and that will help your 
it will help activate more of your ventral vagal tone, which is that state of thriving. Um, silence the negative, make an effort not to complain. Again, choose to think differently. Not, don't be offended. Don't look for reasons to complain. Instead, look for reasons to be grateful and thankful. 